Hello, everyone. Welcome to Growing Together, a gardening podcast with me, John Lamb, and Don Kinsler, a lifelong gardener and the North Dakota State University Extension Horticulturist for Cass County. Don, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you, John. And I'm especially happy today because we are going to talk about trees oh, yes. and shrubs. And I mean, who doesn't like a good tree? They're starting to bud out now. It's a <laughs> perfect time to talk about this. Uh, it is. And you know, man, what would our landscapes be without shrubs? And so I'm excited to talk uh, today. And our special guest today is Dr. Todd West, the North Dakota State University Woody Plants Improvement Director, and a very good uh, college classroom instructor, I might add. Yeah, we should add that onto the title. Very good college <laughs> <laughs> college classroom professor. I know your, your classes are always very well received by the students. So welcome, Todd. Awesome. Thank you, Don. Thank you, John. It's wonderful to be here. Yeah, so the, talk a little bit about what the what the Woody Plants program is. So the Woody Plant Improvement Program has been around for, oh, about 60 years now at NDSU. Uh, one thing to note is that the very first professor at NDSU w- worked on Woody Plants. Okay. So it, the roots go very deep, very long, very <laughs> Pun old. intended? Pun intended. <laughs> no, that would be way back 18... 1800s. Yeah, 1800s. You know, when yeah. it was first formed. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's always fascinating to me how the first instructor uh, at NDSU was a horticulturist. Exactly. And worked on worked developing on uh, woody plants, trees for the Northern Plains. Exactly. Well, that's interesting because you don't, you know, when people think of Fargo, we don't necessarily think of ourselves as a big tree haven or anything like that, or even particularly there is variety, but I think people just tend to think of, you know, oak, elm. And so going back 100 plus years, that's really interesting. Exactly. Exactly. So this program is designed to be able to evaluate uh, plant material that's available in the nursery trade. So that way we can get that information to the extension uh, service and be able to kind of give those thumbs up or thumbs down on what will work, what won't work. But then also we actually evaluate material so we can release material that is well suited for our climate, specifically North Dakota, uh, to, uh, to our clientele. And what a need, you know, uh, of course, our area, you know, North Dakota, the uh, Red River Valley, uh, native prairie without a whole lot of trees, except maybe in the river valleys and, and along the creeks. And so what a need to develop for our area. And so it, it, it's awesome that this research is being done to develop these. Exactly. I think North Dakotans really love their trees. And when we look at, I mean, because over across the state, more than 90% of the land mass is in agriculture production. And so almost every tree in North Dakota has been planted or handled by human hands. And so, yeah, we love our trees here. So it's great. Exactly. And you said the, the, the Woody Plants Improvement Program has been going on about 60 years, did you say? Yeah, because it started back, well, actually probably longer than that, because it started back in the 50s. I mean, yeah, and of course going way back to the origins of NDSU, but when it actually had a name as the Woody Plants yeah. Improvement Program. And, and that program, it really took off with Dr. Dale Herman uh, when he came in in the 70s. Uh, early, early 70s, and and really formulated it and made it into a true program. Yes, and that was uh, my first job out of college was Dr. Dale Herman's technician. That's awesome. Yeah, and so that that was fun. I, I love the program. And now tell us a little bit about, okay, the research on woody plants, you know, trees, shrubs. Uh, how do you actually go about developing or finding new trees and shrubs that are adapted? Sure. Uh, well, sometimes it's just as easy as just driving around a city. And so we actually drive around a lot of small communities and, and you're looking for something unique, something that's different because the city foresters actually have done a lot of work for us with all the different planting. And prior to all of this uh, cultivar development, a lot of the trees that are out there are just seedlings. Uh, and so they have that variation just like you know, the rest of us do, you know, you look at any human, we're, we're all humans, but we all have those little differences. And, and so just simply looking for something that's a little different, something that's handling a situation where, you know, you have a tree that's not growing where it's supposed to. I get a lot of calls from people saying, Hey, I have this tree and, you know, my dad planted it. Uh, and I've been told it really shouldn't be here. And so we go check it out and like, Oh, that's pretty unique. That's, that's kind of neat. So we collect material, we collect material from, you know, the uh, local area, from the region, uh, across the U S across the world. 
you know, we have plants from all over the world. Oh, um, so you partner with some of the areas uh, in, I, I suppose, uh, Europe, Northern Europe, uh, we do. or Asia. We do. That might have climate similar to ours. Exactly. And so we kind of look at that latitude, that Northern latitude, and we kind of explore those areas that would match us. Um, one of the releases that we have uh, is uh, an alder. And the... Um, the common name, well, not the common name, but the cultivar uh, is Harbin, and and so it came from Harbin, China, and oh, Harbin, China, yeah, Harbin, China is almost the exact same climate as us. Really? Yeah. So they have uh, really harsh winters. They have warm summers. It does get a little bit humid. They grow wheat, and and so it's like everything. It's like North Dakota in China. And so it makes sense that their plants would do very well here for sure. us. So that's fascinating. And so you mentioned even driving around looking at things. I remember with Dale Herman back in the 1970s, driving up and down North Dakota cities. <laughs> and, we um, still do that. <laughs> oh, well, sure. And uh, uh, I remember he would – he had a good eye, of course. And he would see a tree on the boulevard, an ash tree, for example, that had just a beautiful shape. You know, like a classic, as though it had been pruned, and so we'd find out, okay, was this a seedling, etc., uh, and and then propagate from that. So you, you you keep an eye out for those, and then of course, then also you partner with uh, areas across the world that have uh, latitude similar to us. Do you do any like actual crossbreeding, like take one of these and one of this, and kind of pollinate and do all the sciency things that researchers do? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And and yes, the neat thing about this program is that, well, with any research program, you kind of stand on the shoulders of your predecessor. Sure. And so we're reaching now where we have a research arboretum, the NDSU Research Arboretum, uh, located out near Absaraca. Yeah, about 40 miles yeah, west about, of yeah. Fargo? Oh, less than that, but it takes about 45 minutes. So sure. it's, it's only about 25, 30 miles. Sure. Um. And there's a specific reason why it's there. Uh, and and we're reaching our 50th year of planting there, which is really special. Um, but prior to, you know, the trees actually getting mature, because it takes quite a long time for trees to mature uh, compared to, you know, like soybean, where you got an annual cycle every year, uh, you know, nobody could really do much of that crossing work. So like my predecessor, Dale, he he did a lot of selection, but he couldn't actually do the breeding because it just takes so long. Sure. And now I've got this giant sandbox. I call it my sandbox because I'm a kid <laughs> every day I go to work <laughs> and I get a play. And so now we are making crosses because we have all this mature material that has kind of been time tested, that has been environmentally tested. And so then now I can make that improvement. And so like a good example is like autumn blaze maple. Very popular. It's one of the most popular trees across the nation. But for us, it's really not a good tree at all. And the reason is, is because of the parents. The red maple is not completely hardy, but it's also not pH tolerant to our soils, which is a high pH. Even silver maple as well can have issues with hardiness, but also with pH. So it was actually selected for a more southern source than for us. So it just doesn't do well. Well, for for example, uh, you know, to to back up what you're saying, okay, the, my three most popular questions that I receive day in, day out, year round, one is how to control rabbits. The next is how to prevent blossom and rotten tomatoes. And number three <laughs> is why is my autumn blaze maple doing so poorly? Exactly. Exactly. The best pruning for an autumn blaze is right at the base. <laughs> Sorry, did I say that out loud? <laughs> <laughs> and so what are you doing? So that's interesting. Okay, the parentage. So what are you kind of doing, working on to maybe kind of improve that? Exactly. And so with all the material that's been collected over the you know last several decades plus, is that we have a set of red maples that we know that do really well for our area. We have a set of silver maples that do really well for our area. And that's that's the two parents that make up Autumn Blaze. So essentially, it, and it's called the Freeman Maples. So essentially now, which actually is going to be happening quick because I just saw all the buds on the maples. They're swelling. They're oh, wow. ready to pop. So they'll be flowering here really soon with these warm days. Uh, and so we'll, be, we'll actually collect pollen from the silver maples that we know that do well. And we'll be painting with our little paintbrushes, you know, playing Bob Ross, making happy little trees. <laughs> we'll be painting pollen onto these female flowers on these red maples. And then vice versa, we'll collect pollen from red maples and put them onto the silver maples. 
Then they'll set seed, we'll collect the seed, then we prepare the seed, we grow it out into little seedlings in the greenhouse, then those little seedlings end up being planted out in a field, and then 20 years from now, we hopefully will have oh, yeah, something. I, that, well, that's, you, you <laughs> Jumping read, ahead. You but. read my mind, Todd, because <laughs> I was thinking, you know, it takes a long time for a tree to go from seed to kind of where you can kind of see what it's doing. How long does it actually take that process? From the time you do a crossing, the pollination, to the time when you can assess whether it's a nice tree. Yeah, it takes anywhere from, well, it, it kind of depends what you're selecting for. There's certain selection components we can do early. But overall, from from that first cross to the you know homeowner being able to buy a tree, you're looking at 20 to 50 years. Isn't that something? What a long-term commitment for a researcher. Exactly. So it's hard for people, especially at in academia and at the university, to understand and wrap their brain around this, that all of the research, well, most of the research that I'm doing is not for me, but it's for my successor. Sure. And what Dale did, a lot of stuff I'm selecting because of what he did, because it takes so long. Sure. You know, some of this, these crosses that I'm making – I, I'll be long retired before anything ever happens to them. Unless you work till 110 or exactly. so. <laughs> but, <laughs> I'm not sure if that's that's in my cards, but <laughs> but but you know, but there is certain selections that we can make early on because like one of the silver maple parents has a very nice cut leaf. And so we can see that in the first oh, year. Sure. Yeah, good point. Because if it has the cut leaf, great, then we keep those. And the ones that don't, we get rid of. So, but again, like you said. Ultimately, I want to know what the final tree is going to look like. You mentioned like the ash driving around going, oh, that one has a beautiful form. And that's what we're always looking for is because people will go, oh, how big is it going to get? What's it going to look like? And if I just make an initial selection after a couple of years saying, oh, it's it's going to be wonderful, I can't tell them those final forms. But more importantly, as we know now with with our climate, you know, when I first moved here, uh, it was a winter just like this winter. It was very mild. And everybody's like, oh, North Dakota has winters. I'm originally a cheesehead from Wisconsin. So I'm like, I know winters. Winters are no, like, no, you don't know a North Dakota winter. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, that first winter was super mild. I'm like, oh, what a bunch of babies. The winters <laughs> here are easy. Well, then the next winter I got my due. Uh, sure. And it was a pretty hard winter. But that's how it is. And, and everybody's like, oh, well, this winter is not normal. And then spring came. And I'm like, well, like, this is not a normal spring. And then summer came. Oh, this is not a normal win- or summer. And I've, what I found is with North Dakota, just nothing's normal. You know, that, that is a good point. You know, for the longest time in gardening, I always thought, well, gosh, you know, I, I'm kind of waiting for a normal, uh, normal growing season. And finally, after many years of gardening, I've come to that conclusion. There is no normal. There's you, no you normal. Know, you deal with what you're dealt at the current time. Exactly. But, you know, Todd, you bring up a good point about how, okay, um, when you're growing out young trees, for example, you can assess early on that a maple maybe has a good cut leaf, okay? Exactly. Other things you need to wait longer on. What are some of the specific things that you are looking for in trees or shrubs? Sure. Well, ultimately, survival. And so it comes down to that winter. Yeah, the winter. Yep. And so that's an easy one. So once we plant them out, they either live or they die. Now, our winters vary. So how many winters do you feel something has to go through before you can deem it winter hardy for our Exactly. And and that's part of that lengthy process. Sure. Because once we get it put out, you know, we may have a mild winter like this winter. Well, this winter for me was a horrible bust, you know. How, how do we horrible bust? Horrible bust because it just didn't get cold enough. Oh, I'm, to, yeah. to gauge. To, so to it's, it's to not gauge. a good scientific. Exactly. I okay. mean, it's a wonder. It was a wonderful winter for right. us to be able to go. Oh, yes, we survived this you know winter because it was nice and mild. But for my research, I'm one of the few people probably in the U.S. that prays for a minus forty yeah. for like a week straight. You probably really want the extremes. I do. Yeah, yeah. just to see a true test of the of the plant. Exactly. That'll separate the wheat from the chaff. Exactly. You know, I, I want it to be really cold. I want the summers to be drought. You know, I'm like, I want the, the most horrible extreme that we can because that helps me. Sure. And unless the that. tree or shrub experiences that, I suppose you don't exactly. really know for sure what it'll take or exactly. not. Exactly. Uh, because we're we're evaluating a plant that shouldn't grow here now. Uh, What's that? So it is a bald cypress. Oh. And so we had some material that we got out of Texas of all places that survived. And it was doing really well until the winter of 2019 into 2020. And then we got that really cold winter. And of course, it 
killed the material. But I was like, well, there's potential. So we we collected from the most northern uh, range because it's a native plant. And there's this disjunct population in northern uh, Indiana. And so we collected from there. We even found there are some plants of, of the taxodium. So it's taxodium disticum, which is the bald cypress, growing in Minneapolis. Really? And so we collected seed from that as well. So we've got these little seedlings that we grew. We planted them out. And then, of course, we get a mild winter. So they're all going to survive. Sure. But next winter, who knows? Sure. Yeah. So, of course, winter hardiness is- So winter hardiness is- Is winter is hardiness kind of the number one, I suppose? Does it, it is. You know, no matter how good something maybe looks, I suppose, if it doesn't survive the winter- Exactly. I mean, because as as gardeners, as landscapers, you know, we're always excited about pushing that boundary. You know, we want to grow sure. things that are not supposed to be here, but then we get that harsh winter, and then it's kind of devastating. But we shouldn't be devastated because we know it shouldn't be here anyway. So yeah, so winter hardiness is number one. Then we look at then what are the other environmental conditions? One being that again, a lot of times we're into drought, so we're looking for plants that can handle that kind of an extreme. Uh, our soil type is typically a very high pH and alkaline soil, so we're always looking for that as well. And and some of that kind of uh, screens for us because the soil that we evaluate on is already a high pH, so we don't have to do any special sciency thing to to screen for that because it's automatically screening for that. And it works really well, you know, because we're developing these plants for North Dakota, but it also equates very well to urban environments. And and that's where a lot of the trees end up are these urban and suburban areas on boulevards and people's landscapes. And the soil of an urban environment is typically high pH. So it's like check. They tend to be very dry check. And and so a lot of our plants do very well with that. So as different communities find out about our program, they're really excited about our, our releases because of that. Then ultimately, you know, we try to look at disease and insects because we know that's the big pressure. Um, and so depending on the plant, depending on the impact, uh, we may do some uh, research specifically or just kind of let nature take its course. You know, one example is we have an American elm release. Um, and so that has actually been tested by being injected with Dutch elm disease. And so we know the mechanism of how it works. So these American elms that are resistant to Dutch elm disease, it's more of a tolerance to Dutch elm disease. So when they get yeah, infected- what, what is the name of that elm? Is that the discovery? No, or so no. Uh, Prairie with, Expedition. Prairie Expedition. Prairie Expedition. Funny, funny thing with Prairie. I don't know if we can do a little side sh- track here, but I, when I first started here, and Don, you mentioned earlier about how you know we are a Prairie State and people are excited about trees. One of the first times I actually went to a nursery association meeting. It was up in Canada, and as I'm walking through, uh, people, uh, one of the nursery owners grabbed me and said. If you ever name another tree prairie something, <laughs> you know, it's going to be the end, you know? And it's like, because don't you understand what the name prairie means? And I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. But but it equated, you know, the trees to our program. When people sure. see the prairie name, Because like, there were oh, a few North things Dakota. named, you know, prairie, quite a few. prairie this, prairie that. Sure. Yeah, quite a few. So Prairie Expedition was an elm that was selected. Uh, it was actually found just south of Fargo along the Wild Rice River. Oh, sure. And so there was Very a nat- yeah, as a native population and it of elm. Survived, uh, it Dutch survived Dutch elm disease. So Dutch elm came through, you know, naturally and it killed off all the other siblings except for this one solo tree. And so again, it was the same kind of an idea where somebody reached out to to the program, reached out to Dale, say, Hey, I have this special tree. And and then so then looking at it, they they propagated it and then did some injection testing uh, here at NDSU and also found also where you where it was actually injected with the Dutch elm was, disease. Purposely. The, then you could determine that it wasn't just a fluke. That exactly, it like escaped. it was an escape. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was actually injected oh, with Dutch elm disease. Found that it walls it off. And and so then it's like great, this is going to be a great tree and release then to the nursery trade and. It's doing extremely well in the national elm trials, and it's become very popular now. Yeah, is the original tree still there? I've not seen it. You know, Funny sometimes that things, you ask things that. get cut down or for other reasons. Yeah, disappear. there's I've a not lot of, seen the original tree. No, there's a lot of irony. When I uh, first arrived here, I wanted to see the parent tree, and I went down and saw it. It was beautiful. And then uh, came back a year or two later, and all of a sudden I noticed it was like – because it's it's lone tree right on a oxbow of the I've wild seen rice. Photos of yeah, it. and then going down, I'm like. 
something looks funny with a tree. And at the base, it just looked, had this kind of uh, haze to it. And I'm like, that's really weird. And the closer I got, I realized it was chicken wire. Somebody had wrapped chicken wire around the base of this lone giant elm tree that had to have been over a hundred years old. Sure. Well, being the only tree on like an oxbow bend of the wild rice, a beaver found it. Oh, wow. And completely girdled it all the way around. And so here it survived one of the biggest disease issues, you know, in the history of the United States. And when a lone beaver took it down. It probably didn't take long for that beaver to chew it. No. (laughs) All right. We'll take a quick little break and we come back more with Todd West. When you can't make it to City Hall or school board meetings, local journalists from Inform.com will be there to report the facts and get your questions answered. Local news works for you. Stay up to date at Inform.com. All right, we're back with Todd West from NDSU's Woody Plants Improvement Program. Todd, I wanted to ask, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but... um, you were talking about the trees that are budding out now, especially like the maples that you've been working on. And we talked about this over the winter with this being such a kind of up and down winter. It was really warm. Then it got really, really cold. And we were seeing the buds kind of forming early. I think a lot of people will be wondering uh, how their trees are doing. And I know you can't respond to everybody's personal tree, but like, what are you seeing? Are you seeing that there was much of an impact on this kind of warming, freezing, warming, freezing cycles that we went through? Yeah, it definitely got kind of scary there for a while of how warm we did get for as long as we were. But fortunately, we didn't get warm too long where things actually did break bud. Uh, and we went back to that cold phase again. So I really don't see having any issues with the trees really at all from this winter just because of the cycle that we went through. Um, and And things are maybe a little bit early this year, but overall, I think they're right on track. I've been scratching a lot of twigs. So yeah, far, same. everything looks green under the outer bark. So yeah. I, I keeping my fingers crossed. I don't think we're going to have too many problems. Well, that's good to go. <laughs> yeah. Um, you talked a little bit about uh, how long it takes to to develop the varieties, right? I mean, like it can it could really take a long, long time. We're talking about this with that you saying basically within your after after you retire. Yes, that, that these things will keep. Because there's actually a lot of factors that go into the development of a new tree variety. Uh, you know, from our end, it's the, you know, how is it going to withstand these, you know, environmental impacts? How, you know, what is it going to look like when it's you know, mature? But then it has to go through other phases of working with a nursery. You know, we actually have to get with a nursery that is interested in it first. So then we have to kind of market this new plant to them. Because when it comes down to it is that any tree that a producer will add they almost have to take something away. And that taking away, they've spent a lot of years figuring out how it grows. Do they have to grow it in a container? Is it going to be in the field? How big of a caliper? You know, how big of the tree can they grow to sell? You know, do they dig it in the winter? Do they dig it in the spring? You know, there's so many factors. But then also just simply marketing for catalogs and getting people to know the Autumn Blaze name. Right. You know, it, it, it takes a long time for that. Sure. And so, so, t- so when you find something, a tree or shrub, that looks promising to mm-hmm. you. Uh, where do you go from there? Do you like propagate and increase it or do you, how does this go about getting onto the market? Yeah. So what we do is as soon as we see something that's promising, we start working with as many nurseries as we can. Uh, you know, we tell them what is new and what, what we're working on. We'll get them materials and then they'll start evaluating it as well. Uh, and so that way they can see how the production phases go. So there's a few kind of Cinderella stories that we have where it, it takes a little bit on that uh, lower end limit of you know 20 years or less instead of that 50 year. Because like we have one, uh, it is an, another new elm uh, called Northern Empress. And it's one that had been kind of on the uh, front burner as, as a potential release. And we got it out to nurseries uh, fairly early. And it just so happened that one of the nurseries was looking for a replacement of an elm. 
And so it just happened to come out at the right time, right place, and and fit into their production schedule really well because they were having problems with uh, digging this other tree and it didn't really store well. And so they were like, okay, we'll give yours a try. It dug well and it stored well. It's like, okay, great, perfect. And so it was, uh, so we released Northern Empress back in 2012. And here we are now in 2024 and it's finally available. So when you send, um, so when you send material of the promising material out to, and this goes to the large wholesale nurseries that, it does, are, that yes. are propagating. Exactly. And, and that's what we always have to start with is those that are doing the propagating, they can build the numbers, you know, and then it has that kind of trickle down economics where then the smaller producers can purchase the material from them. They can grow it up to different sizes. Um, but yeah, it, it, we really have to go with those bigger producers first. And sometimes they're like, yeah, it doesn't really fit for us. And we have to find then somebody else. Um, we have another birch release, which is my favorite tree called Cinnamon Curls. And again, it's available finally now. You can get it at many of your local garden centers and nurseries. But the first nursery we went to, they're like, oh, we love it. But it, we figure that it will take about three years in a production field. And we only do two-year production fields. So we can't grow it. Yet when we dig all of yours that are under valuation, everybody at the company wants one to put in their yard. I'm like, so I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> you all love it, but but see, it doesn't, doesn't fit the production model. Sure. And so then it went to another nursery, same thing. They're like, we love it. It just – because it's a dwarf birch. And so it grows a little bit slower. So it doesn't fit their production schedule. So then finally, we ended up with a nursery that specializes in long-term type of materials. And they love it. It fits their model. And they're growing it. So there's really a lot of marketing involved in this too. Are you there involved is. in that or is that a separate uh, colleague? That's, no, that's I right. wish I had a separate colleague. <laughs> <laughs> I need to clone myself. Um, no, no. Unfortunately, you know, we wear many hats and it all kind of comes down to, to us. If we don't market our materials, it really doesn't go anywhere. So sure. scientist and exactly. seller. Exactly. Yeah. And we should say too that NDSU doesn't sell these. You're not selling, the, you're not a retail wholesaler. Or Correct. Anything. Retail outlet for these. Yes, that is one of the caveats we want to make very clear. If you discover an NDSU information online and see what we're doing and find that plant you love, don't call me. <laughs> but, so NDSU does not sell N NDSU these. NDSU does not sell does not these. Sell so and produce what you need these. to do is go to your local garden center or nursery and ask them for that plant. So they can a, help it's you. It's a fascinating process. So these large wholesale nurseries that are producing all this, once they get on board, with this and say, we're going to go with it. Then they start increasing and producing it. Then the local garden centers uh, can buy this from the wholesalers and we start seeing it on the shelf of the garden center. Exactly. Yeah. And so, so anyway, so yeah, because I know I get lots of questions uh, when they see uh, one of these beautiful new releases, uh, they say, oh, well, whereabouts at NDSU can we buy this from? So it is your local garden centers and um, most often the locally owned uh, garden centers are probably the ones that might be quickest on board with these. Correct. You know, most of our material does not really end up in the box stores. Uh, it really is more of that uh, independent garden center nursery. So yeah, definitely go to those and you should be able to find what you need. Do you walk through a center every once in a while in the summer and say, hey, I had a hand in that? I do. I actually that's I, gotta be fun. Yeah, I love going to garden centers and, and nurseries. And most often I'll actually end up like in the tree section and and I'll see a couple that are kind of debating what tree they should buy. And I come up and I said, Do you need a little help? And they're like, Oh yeah, yeah. Can you help us? And I'm like, sure. And I said, What are you looking for? You know, where is this gonna go? What's the purpose? And by the end, you know, we've got a tree sold for them. And then they turn to me and say, Okay, can you load this up into your car into our car? And I'm like, I don't work here. And they're like, Wait, you don't work here? You're walking away. <laughs> and I said, I'm just here to help. <laughs> you know, what I enjoy when I look at the tree and shrub section too is I enjoy it when the garden centers are marketing it as an NDSU release very yes. visibly because that gives people an assurance that yes, this was developed here for here. 
Exactly. And and we are very fortunate through the North Dakota Department of Agriculture, there is a specially crop block grant program. And we were able to get a grant for marketing of the NDSU materials because so many people don't know about it. And when they're produced from these big commercial uh, nurseries, they'll have the plant tag on it, but nowhere on there does it say that it, it came from NDSU. Nowhere on there it says this is perfect for you in North Dakota. And so we actually were able to get a grant and our regional uh, nurseries and garden centers here in North Dakota participated. And so we had a lot of marketing material available, brochures, signs, and even tags on the trees that say this is an NDSU select plant. Yeah, and, that's awesome. and so it really gives that recognition so people can go, oh, this tree is right for me. And it's like, yeah. and that's what all that this tag research. alone is good marketing. Exactly. Cause my research is supposed to benefit the state of North Dakota and that's what it's all about. Well, you know, what's fun is we've been talking a lot about all these special varieties. Let, let's talk about some of these. I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to sure. kind of get into these and, and have you kind of mention some of these names of some of these stars that have come out of the program. Yeah, I mean there there's some that are just absolutely fabulous that you wouldn't expect to to have here. One is uh, spring welcome magnolia. That's on my bucket list. I gotta yes. have one. I think people will be really excited about that. A Can magnolia, you talk about it a little bit? Yeah. yeah, magnolia up magnolia. here in the north. Exactly. You know, it's, it's a plant you definitely don't see in the north. You think of magnolia, you always think of the you know the southern charm kind of thing. But here we have this magnolia that can handle our extreme winters. It it is so floriferous. It creates so many flower buds. It's just amazing, and it's available. Are the, how how big do the flowers get? So the flowers are probably about the you know a little bit smaller than your fist. Okay, but they're a big size flower. Yeah. Magnolias are, are really known size. for saying you know, hey, look at me. Right, very flashy, <laughs> very flashy. And and the cool thing about uh, about spring welcome is that again, it's just just such a rare looking uh, plant, and it does so exceptionally well here um, that it really is a shining star. Um, some of the newer ones that, that I like, uh, I've already mentioned that Northern Empress elm, um, cause one of the big problems with elm is that they grow really fast and it can be almost too fast for a homeowner. It's good for a municipality because they can prune it, they can shape it properly, but a homeowner, it's a little bit too much. I'm always very cautious in recommending an elm, but this one is a smaller stature elm and it doesn't grow as fast. So it, it it's really a perfect little shade tree, but then it gets a burgundy fall color. I was going to ask you about that because you know we're all into fall color. You know, that's exactly. why the autumn blaze, autumn blaze maple. Oh, and so a burgundy fall color on on an on an elm. elm. I mean, th- there there are definitely other elms that have burgundy fall color, but none of them that are hardy here. And what I really like about this tree is that it's nearly seedless, and because elms can be kind of messy, and that kind of turns that's my a lot worst of people weed off. in our flower beds. Yeah, <laughs> is Siberian <laughs> funny? elm. Yeah, Siberian elm, even American elm. You know, yeah, it, they it have can't no be dormancy. Invasive, but, they drop their seed oh, and sprout immediately, and they drop a lot of flowers seed. and landscapes. <laughs> exactly. And you won't have that problem with this with this elm. Yeah. So again, it was called Northern Empress Northern Empress Elm. Beautiful, beautiful plant. Um, we also have a, a new mugo uh, that is very close to what Tannenbaum. If you're familiar with Tannenbaum, an upright mugo. No, it's a mugo pine. It's a mugo pine. pine. Yep, and and it grows a little bit faster than Tannenbaum, which is nice because people want that more instant gratification. So anytime we can get a plant, because mugo pine in general is one of the slowest growing pines, so any improvement that we can get on the growth rate is is a benefit. Yeah, so what is the height, eventual height on eventual that? height's about fifteen foot. Oh well, sure. So it's a you know I've got one where it's planted right in the corner of my house. It's a really nice accent plant. But you get that extra growth, but it has a better winter color than Tannenbaum. So we're always looking for that little bit of improvement as well. Um, Spot so talking about color, like when you were talking about the, uh, the the people always want the maple blaze. Yes. What would you say if someone were to, like if you were to run across that couple again in a yep. in a garden center and they were looking at a maple blaze, you'd maybe say, you know, that's fine, but check out exactly. And you know, and that's where I I can't be too uh, exclusive with just NDSU because we do try other other materials, you know, because we we have a maple uh, called Northern Flare. Uh, that actually gets pretty good color, 
But then some of the other materials that we'll trial, like um, University of Minnesota has releases that are actually fabulous. So like if I'm at the garden center and somebody's looking at that autumn blaze, I'll kind of pull them by their ear and take them down the row and say, how about a firefall maple instead? You know, it's not an NDSU release, but it's still a really good plant. And what so if they just want fall color and not necessarily think maple, but uh, w- what else you know, for fall color? Uh, anything else on the NDSU introductions that just give nice fall color, not necessarily maple. Right. And, you know, one of the problems that I always have with fall color is that everybody's stuck on that red. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, and and if we think about it, if if everybody had a tree that just turned bright red and all we had was a red landscape, it wouldn't be that exciting. Kind of. You really look yeah. for a gold then. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, so that's why, you know, like when we always talk about when people ask me, like, what should I plant? What's the best tree to plant? And and I'm really firm now on the look around rule. And I said, so stand where you're going to plant your tree and look around. If you see a birch, don't maybe plant a birch. If you see a maple, don't plant a maple. Plant something else. But for fall color, there's lots of different trees. So, you know, I, I just mentioned birch. You know, birch get a beautiful golden fall color. You know, we need those other colors in there. Um, one that I'm excited, and maybe it's a little bit too early to say, but uh, it's going to be out probably in the next three years because uh, it's it's they're building up numbers now. Is, is our cool cat Katsura tree? Can you, uh, can you good, repeat that name? Cool, yeah, cool cat Katsura. Cool cat cool Katsura cat. with all K's. Okay, <laughs> Dude, talk about marketing exactly. Yes. And well, and that's the big thing too is that you have to come up with a really catchy name because if you don't, it just get, kind of gets lost. And and so you know, again, I, I hate to always go back to Autumn Blaze, but it's a good name. Yeah, it tells you what it is. It, yeah, well, you yeah, know exactly. Definitely. You know, and so for us, the cool cat is the fact that Katsura shouldn't be growing here. Uh, but we got material and trialed it, and it's doing very well. And what I love about Katsura tree is that it'll range from a gold to like orange red, but it'll be nice. kind of all over the tree. It's not just one color. But what's great about Katsura is that when the leaves start dropping, it smells like uh, um, almost like burnt sugar, like cotton candy. Oh, really? Yeah, and it's very distinct, and it's not a bad smell by any means. Sure. It's it's really really How tall nice. Does a Katsura tree. Get? Katsura gets up into that kind of mid range, about 30, 35 foot. So mm. a really nice uh, yard, nice tree. yard tree. Yeah, sure. And that is one that NDSU has developed. That is one that has uh, NDSU has developed. And you said it'll still be a couple of years before it we still see it will out? be. Yeah, because okay. we got we have two nurseries that are going to be producing it, but they're just building up numbers and size. Okay, you know that's the thing because. You know, they'll have these small little trees, but they're not ones that you want to plant in your yard. You want one that actually starts having that caliper to it. Yeah. And you know, will that be a how fast will that tree grow? What you know, it's a moderate grower. Okay. So you know, it's not super fast. You know, I, I'm not a big fan of fast growing trees. That's the other thing that everybody always asks. Like, right. I want something that grows fast. I'm I want like, it now. Yeah, but you really are gonna sacrifice a few things with that fast growing tree. So you gotta be a little bit careful with that. You know, you mentioned good names for marketing on the uh, the list uh, on the list of the NDSU. Uh, one of the names that intrigues me is the Lava Burst Ohio Buckeye. Lava Burst, that is a beautiful tree. That nice that, name that really ranks up there. Yeah, and we you know you try to pick a name that is a little bit descriptive, and and so when we were coming up with a name for this, it's like okay, so Ohio Buckeye is known for having really good fall color, at least the cultivars. The the species, not so much because they usually leaf scorch in late summer and they drop their leaves. The cultivars hold their leaves. They get good fall color. And this is one that is a nice, reliable, beautiful orangey red. And this tree is special because it's more of an upright. Buckeyes are usually as wide as they are tall, but this one's very narrow. And hmm, so it so might f- uh, fit well in some of our smaller space yards. Totally. And that's where I definitely recommend it. It will fit perfectly in a yard. It even it will be, do well in a boulevard because boulevard trees, they want to have more narrow. And and so when you think, so when we come up with these names, we just have pages and pages of, you know, we just write down whatever we can come up with. And then finally, uh, you know, lava burst is what, what kind of came about and it's like, oh, that's perfect because it gives you that kind of that color, but it also gives the idea of, of the form and shape that it will have. It's lava bursting out of the ground. 
And of course, uh, the program has been productive over the years. Is how many in all um, cultivars have been released, trees and shrubs, yeah. through this program? So the first release actually started way back in the early 80s or mid 80s. Uh, and we've had 62 releases now. Uh, now, not everything makes it into the nursery trade. You know, some things that just people just never really catch on. Um, but we've had quite a quite a good run, uh, and quite a few of these are actually available in the nursery trade to this day. Yeah, any others that that you really love to mention? Any of the others in all these that um, that you especially like to point out? Well, we really didn't talk anything, talk a whole lot about shrubs, and you know, you mentioned shrubs at the beginning. But one of my favorites that will be available this not this year but next year is the fire flare orange azalea. Oh. And again, another one that people azalea. you don't expect much of an right. azalea here. Um, there is the the Northern Light series, but they're really not tolerant to our pH, uh, so that's one of the, the big problems with them. But this is uh, an azalea that has been basically under evaluation since the seventies, and it does very well in our high pH, uh, and it's plenty hardy, um, and it has all the beautiful traits. You get an amazing bud count, flower bud count in the spring, and it's this fire orange red, uh, just a blast of color. And then you get a nice uh, foliage during the summer, but then in the, the fall, it turns a nice burgundy. So you get both ends. You get spring and fall out of this shrub. Just Gorgeous. You know, I have so many things on my wish list. One of the things I do have that's one of my favorite shrub, landscape shrubs is Dakota Sunspot Potentilla. Oh, yes. That is beautiful absolutely plant. beautiful. Big, uh, sunny yellow flowers. The shape, the form of it is good. I love it. I've got three in a little grouping. Yeah. Well, and, and it's funny because that's an older selection but it's still one of the best potentillas. If you're going to plant a yellow potentilla, that's the one. And I see it in garden centers. Still, exactly. Yeah, Dakota Sunspot Potentilla. Yeah. I love it. Oh, it's a beautiful plant. You know, another one uh, that I just planted this last year. You see, I've got so many things on my wish list, and I'm, I'm trying to plant them <laughs> as I can. Uh, but it is the Copper Curls. Help me with the name. Uh, Copper oh, yeah. Curls Lilac. The Copper Curls Peak and Lilac. Yes. Beautiful. I always, you know, because- Mine is still young. Sure. But beautiful tree. Absolutely gorgeous. You know, Japanese tree lilac is a great tree because it really has no disease issues. It has really no pest problems. Super tolerant to high pH, super tolerant to drought. But then it's like, well, how can we make it better? And the only way you can make it better is get a peak in lilac instead <laughs> because it's all the traits of Japanese tree lilac, but then you get exfoliating curly bark. And so that's where the copper curls that's name comes from. That's where the copper from. curls name comes from because the bark, as the species, the bark is generally just a brown. But with the cultivar selections, and there's other cultivars of peak and lilac, but copper curls by far is the hardiest. So it's the one that you should be planting here. But the bark just peels like a paper birch, and it is a copper color. It's just a beautiful. And when the sun shines through it, absolutely fabulous. Because even as young as ours is, uh, this will be the third growing season. It's already starting to develop that nice yeah. bark on it. It's gorgeous. And it's kind of funny because the parent tree is on the NDSU campus. And unfortunately, oh. we're going to be losing it this year because they're tearing the building down that it's next to. Uh. So. Comes and goes. What would you, is there one plant that, um, you know, because in the history of the program here, you're talking about the, been producing, uh, producing these plants for so long. Is there one plant that you think people would say like, oh, I never even realized that that was an NDSU product. Is there like one of the things that you think is the, maybe the most popular that, that you see that people are, that, that people are out there and people may really think like, oh, I didn't never knew that that was a yeah. NDSU product. A lot of a lot of we have um, ash selections of all things, okay. and those were extremely popular. People, you know, planted them all over the U.S. Didn't realize that it was all coming out of NDSU, and oh. and it was almost all exclusively these cultivars of ash were NDSU selections. You know, you go any state, Kansas, you know, Washington, Michigan, you know, wherever, and they were NDSU plants. And unfortunately, with emerald ash borer. 
that kind of ended that. But a lot of these plants, you know, people just don't realize that we have a program here that is doing this, you know, because they, again, they think of us as a prairie. They think of us as that, that, you know, we're doing all this wheat research and which is great, you right. know, and that is very important. But when it comes to trees, people don't equate North Dakota. They don't equate North Dakota State University and, and they're like, oh yeah, I've heard of that tree or I've planted that tree. You know, we have, uh, Northern Acclaim Honey Locust. Sorry, okay. Kind of lost the name there for a minute. <laughs> um, you know, we have Prairie and then we have Northern, you know, so yeah. that's the other part. <laughs> so it's like I had to think, what Northern what? Northern what? Uh, Northern Acclaim Honey Locust, Thornless Honey Locust. Yeah, that that's one's all super popular. Place. It's everywhere. Yeah. You know, and, and growers in Wisconsin love it. Growers in Minnesota. And, you know, so it's just kind of becoming a commonplace tree. And again, people just don't equate it back yeah, to North Dakota. Yeah, that's kind of like the buttercup of trees. You know, people don't realize the buttercup squash was exactly. developed at NDSU. Exactly. And so it's it's fun to see some of those trees all over the place. And yeah, that's, that's NDSU. Exactly. You know, like I was, uh, again, back up in Canada. And I think I was at um, Ontario. Ontario or Edmonton. I don't know. I lose track. But I was coming out of the airport and then there's Dakota Pinnacle trees planted right in a row, right outside the terminal at the airport. You know, I'm like, oh yeah, that's our plant. <laughs> yeah. I, I take students to these landscape competitions and we were in a man, Manhattan, Kansas at Kansas State University. And one of the competitions is this tree ID, tree and shrub ID. So I took them to a local nursery and so they could get used to plant material and seeing what it would look like in the pot. And there's the the potentilla, um, you know, for sale in Kansas, you know, and and so again, it's just surprising to see a lot of this material everywhere. All right, we'll take another quick break. When we come back, more with Todd West from North Dakota State University's Woody Plants Improvement Program, including a sneak peek at what could be coming. Ooh, drum roll. <laughs> If you're loving this podcast, be sure to check out our full lineup. From news and local politics to sports and true crime, find your next great listen right now at inforum.com slash podcasts. That's inforum.com slash podcasts. All right, we're back with Dr. Todd West from North Dakota State University's Woody Plants Improvement Program. And Todd, you were going to give us a little bit of a sneak preview of some things. We've talked about some plants that are out there or that will be out there very, very soon. Uh, what are some things that down the road that, that you're excited about? Can you reveal some of the secrets oh, that I are can. going on? You know, it, it's never 100% that, that it's going to make it or not, you know, because again, what I think is great, a nursery may go, eh. They're not too excited about it, but uh, we do actually have a new sugar maple that oh. we're probably going to release this year. We're, we're right now formulating names. So, um, But what's really great about it is that it has this perfect gumdrop shape. And so uh, Little Leaf Linden, uh, there's a cultivar called Greenspire. It's the most popular cultivar. It's planted all over Fargo. You can see it everywhere. The problem with Linden is that one is that it's been overplanted because it does so sure. well. And so that's a problem with diversity. Uh, but also it only gets a kind of a yellow green fall color at best. So it's not a great fall color, but you know, again, we don't want to stick just to one color, but with this sugar maple, it has the same form as green spire, but then you actually get fall color. You're going to get an orangey red. So it's kind of like that idea of Japanese tree lilac. I love it but let's go with the pecan lilac because we get extra feature of the peely bark. So here now, instead of planting a linden, let's plant a sugar maple, which is not actually overplanted through the Fargo, you know, Moorhead area and across North Dakota that, you know, here we can replace this tree that's being overplanted with something that's underplanted and still have this beautiful benefit. Yeah, so, and a nice tailored shape. Of oh, course, that's gorgeous. That works so well in yards, boulevards, yeah. uh, you know, something that doesn't get so big, huge, sprawly. Exactly. I mean, it looks like somebody has sheared it to that gumdrop shape and no pruning oh, has ever so been stay done tuned. with it. Stay tuned. Um, we also have a hybrid, uh, two hybrids that are coming out. Uh, they're actually hybrid with Norway maple and another one that's called Shangtung maple out of China. And there is a sunset series. And again, that's going back to the research part where we trialed the sunset series of these hybrid maples that are from a commercial nursery. They're not hardy. You know, we do not recommend them at all, even though they recommend them as a zone four hardy. They're not zone four hardy. 
And so we found that ours are because we have a Norway maple and a truncatum maple that were planted near each other. And the Norway maple is from seed from northern Finland. Oh, wow. And so it has this extreme hardiness. And, and so then with this cross, you know, we can't release the Finland Norway, which I think some people would like because it's being put on invasive lists. Uh-huh. But when you when the cross with Norway and the truncatum maple, what happens is that they actually lose kind of seed vigor. They they're, they don't actually have that ability to be really invasive. But the the leaves on leaves on the one comes out. It has a beautiful burgundy color for most of the season. Oh, really? Has, yeah. Then it has a bronzy kind of fall color. Oh, so not just in the fall of the year, no, but it actually, it has, actually has that color burgundy during the year. color during the year. Yeah, and it has a leaf nice. that's very similar to Norway maple. Then the other one I call Mr. Crinkle. You know, that's not the official name yet, but the, <laughs> but the leaf is about half the size of what it should be, and the margin is all wavy. Is, is that a maple, did you say? Or it is a maple. a maple. It's the same cross. It's the Norway with the truncatum. Yeah, I don't know if Mr. Crinkly, is, is that a good marketing name? No, it's not, but it's, it's just the way we refer to it because it yeah, has this little crinkle leaf. It looks kind of like lettuce, oh, you know, oh, the, how it's, oh, it's wavy like that. Um, but then it gets a really nice orangey red fall color. Nice. Um, we're actually, hopefully in the not so distant future, maybe have a magnolia or two. It's hard to say. We've been doing a lot of breeding with magnolias. Uh, we've been doing a lot of breeding with that Freeman maple as well, with the silver and the red. So hopefully we'll have something of that in the future too. And so where where does where is the, where is this magical sandlot that you work in? Uh, is this you talked a little bit about Absrak? Is this out there? Yeah. And so the original work all happened here in Fargo. Unfortunately, in Fargo we have the heavy clay because we're in the ancient glaciated bed of Lake Agassiz. And so early on, not early on, but decades ago, the horticulture faculty wanted to find another place where they could do research that would be better representative of the rest of the state. And so they happened to get uh, a lead on a farm that is located near Absarac. It's about a 45-minute drive from Fargo West. It's northwest of Castleton. And uh, it's right on the beach edge. So we have a nice sandy loam soil. We still have the high pH, which is great uh, because, again, that helps me with my selection process. But it's not that heavy clay. And so it's a great research location. So that's the NDSU Horticulture Research Farm within the research farm. So it's an 80-acre farm. It used to be a wheat farm back in the day. And within that 80 acres, we have the research arboretum is in the center. And so about 55 of the 80 acres, maybe even 60, is in woody plant improvement. The arboretum itself is about 35 acres. Uh, And so that's our prime site. We also have plantings in a lot of the different places across North Dakota, Bismarck, Dickinson, Minot, Williston. We have actually a big planting that we're doing up in Langdon uh, because Langdon is always hopefully a solid zone three. And that's what we really want. So you don't want them to change. No, (laughs) I I want them to be nice and cold Fargo, you know, and, and our research arboretum is, is a little bit too warm for, for me. So Langdon is the place to be. Um, and, and that really helps us out with our research. Yeah. So testing at various sites really does give a representative sample then of what's going on within the state. Exactly. You know, cause we have such varying climates, you know, cause the Eastern part of the state is, you know, wetter than the Western part of the state, you know, obviously the Southern part is warmer than the Northern. So, you know, there, there's just so much going on. So it's, it's important that we do trial this material across the entire state. Uh, and you said, uh, you know, with the um, with the the uh, plot there in in um, in Absaraca, uh that's not generally it's, it's an arboretum, but maybe not an arboretum as people think of an arboretum as in a park, right? Exactly. It's it's a facility. It's, it, a, it's a research facility. It's, it's a research facility. You know, I I think the dream was to make it kind of like the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum where people could come out, they could bring a picnic, they could stroll around and just enjoy it because it is an amazing place. You know, once you get there and go in, you you would never believe that you're in North Dakota. I would it say, is truly yeah, awesome. I, I always say it's, it's the gem of North Dakota, sometimes the hidden gem of North Dakota. Um, you know, I always say that we, we have the largest woody plant collection in the entire state. The only 
people that rival us is the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, but we don't do weddings. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and there was, I think, Don, you had a you had an event out there last year, or there where there was an event out there that you you offered a, a tour of, right? Yes. We talked e- about e- that. Each year there each has year, been yeah. uh, kind of an open house educational day. Correct. At the at the Arboretum, the research farm. Yeah, so what we've been doing is that we always have an open house. Uh, It's generally now in September. Uh, This year is going to be a little different uh, than what we've done in the last few years because we've had it on a Saturday, kind of a full Saturday event. But because it is our 50th anniversary, uh, we're having a special open house on Friday afternoon evening of September 6th. And we're kind of tying it into a weekend event because then we hope to have uh, some on-campus events Saturday morning. And then that day is the Trees Bowl with NDSU. So we're trying to make a big weekend celebration. But on Friday, September 6th is when we're going to have our big celebration event on celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Arboretum. That'll be fun. So that's something that we should all Keep an eye out for for more details. And that exactly. research farm and arboretum is awesome. A, a couple of years ago, uh, a couple of years ago, the attendance was so great. I mean, it was good last year too, uh, each year. And a couple of years ago, um, it was uh, standing room only. Uh, could could there I was say a lot of people? Almost <laughs> too many people. A lot, a lot of people. Great, Parking but... was really, really out there, it far was out, and, and so it was fun to see. And it, it's hard to paint a picture uh, of how great that arboretum is out there. And I mean, thirty-five to forty, fifty acres of trees and shrubs. That's a lot of trees and shrubs, and it, it is, is awesome. Some of the trees and shrubs are quite old that have been yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. You know, since, well, maybe 50, 50 years. 50 years. And, of course, I know that you need to keep uh, assessing new things, so I'm sure some things are taken down, others are newly planted. Correct. What a great research area. Oh, it's just absolutely beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah, and of course it's near and dear to my heart because when I started working, uh, you know, out of college, you know, we did a lot of the planting and working out there. So it's 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 awesome. So I really encourage people to stay tuned uh, for yes. that September open house and event for that weekend, and, and, and you'll be seeing a lot. I'm going to write the garden column about it, you know, well in advance. So that's exactly. going to be awesome. We are going to also have a second open house, which I believe will probably be mid-September, somewhere in there. Again, you know, we'll get information out. That will be more of a traditional uh, tour of talking about more of the research. So if you want to get more into the depth of that, We'll have that open house as well. But the the, the one on the Friday, September 6th is just going to be a big party. Yeah, oh, that's going to be. Yeah, because quite quite a quite an event. Fifty years. Fifty years doesn't happen every day to our <laughs> <laughs> no. no. Well, Todd, thank you so much for coming by. This has been a lot of fun, and it's gonna now. I'm gonna be looking for the NDSU tag in, right. in the garden centers. I encourage everybody else to do that. Uh, I want I want to go plant some trees. Me I know. too. Me too. All right. Well, thanks again for coming by. I really appreciate awesome. that. Thank, Thank you, you so Todd. much. Thank you. And Don, if people have questions about uh, if people have questions about their own woody plants, or if they want just want to send in pictures, what's the best way to reach you? Send me an email: donald.kinsler, K-I-N-Z-L-E-R at ndsu.edu. And thanks for all the nice letters and questions that I receive. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for listening, everyone. Mm-hmm.